Joining us for more on the increasing need for foster parents is Kristen Candle, uh, the recruitment specialist for the Sarasota YMCA Safe Children Coalition, Catherine Shea, president and CEO of the Florida Center for Early Childhood. She also chairs the Community Alliance of Sarasota County. And Nathan Scott, a child welfare systems advocate with the Family Safety Alliance. And thank you uh, for being here tonight. And let's begin with this awful video and photos that we've been seeing from around the nation. It was a Wisconsin couple suspected of overdosing in a car with their um, their grandchild, actually the woman's grandchild, in the back seat. And this made national news. Uh, the child has been removed from the woman's custody. Uh, she was sentenced actually just today to 180 days uh, in jail uh, after this, after fighting to gain custody of this child. The child has now been uh, taken to family members, I believe, in, in North or, or South Carolina. And that really kind of puts really um, a finger on, on what the problem is, not only across the country, uh, but especially here on the Sun Coast, because it, it seems that as bad, as bad as it is elsewhere, it's even worse here. Well, I would say absolutely, absolutely. yes. Um, could you just, uh, all of you, uh, tell us about the, the incredible increase in, in the need for foster families in our area? Sure. Uh, Alan, let me start with some numbers just to put it into perspective. So um, in Sarasota, Manatee, and DeSoto County, we're serving 1,489 kids total. Um, 915 of those children are in out-of-home care with 320 of those children in foster care and we only have 248 licensed foster beds in those three counties so it is a, it's a definite need for foster homes. How long has this been going on for? Mm. Well, I'd say that um, in, we have some statistics that in 2013 we were removing about um, 20 to 40 children in a month. Um, in 2015, just last year, and continuing into 2016, we've been removing as many as 40, up to 75 children a month. Now, here's the uh, million-dollar question. Uh, as the number of kids being removed and go going into foster care, how has your resources increased to handle that? Well, our resources have not increased at all. I think the system is extremely strained. Um, and it, it crosses all systems. I think that's what people need to understand, that when you have the little ones, the babies, and, and our agency has many of the children in the foster care system that we're treating in our preschool program, in our mental health um, department and infant mental health, you are absolutely draining the resources. And when you have a traumatized child, and that child will be traumatized, uh, maybe for life. Mm -hmm. um, you have got to pour a lot of resources into the foster parents. They need tremendous support caring for some of these children who, if they've been prenatally exposed to drugs, and they probably have, um, many of them have significant behavioral challenges. So we're not coming close to having the resources that we need as a system to affect this. Personal note, my parents took into uh, a foster child, actually, you know, a cousin of, of mine, and, and I could tell you firsthand what happens when they are infants and toddlers hard wires yes, uh, them absolutely. and there are, are certain things that happen that you you never that get, has, get away from yes um, there seems to be two elements here in terms of of the need for financial resources uh, for these organizations but also the need for foster uh, families and how easy has that been to come by it's been very difficult um, so the need um, for homes um, has been increased, but the amount of people coming forward to foster has not increased, unfortunately. Um, so we're actually looking to bring attention to this issue so that we can bring those people forward, people who have a heart for children um, and have a heart for community service as well, because they're taking care of our children in our community. And I would imagine there's a, there is difficulty with that because you or desperately need the people to come forward, but you need the right people to come forward because you know, on the flip side, we, we heard from time to time terrible stories yes. about what happens to kids in, in foster care. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're not cutting any corners as far as who we allow to um, foster. So that is one thing that the public can feel very good about. Right. Uh, when you have reached out to both the state and federal government in terms of, of needs uh, to fund these organizations and get the resources to the children, what too often has been the result? Well, I, I think we live in a particularly challenging state that's um, becoming more and more conservative. We just held our Community Alliance Legislative Summit today 
um, and heard some really pretty depressing news from our, our speaker, who was the United Way uh, Suncoast CEO, of some of the comments that Senator Negron, who's going to be the House um, Speaker, has made even before session begins, and that, that that is that he doesn't believe in soft services, and he considers mental health and substance abuse and in-home prevention services as soft services. Um, that's the climate that we're living in. All right, we're going to jump into that in great detail in our next segment, but we we'll have to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll hear more about how heroin is impacting our community in our expert interview. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, we are discussing the increasing need for foster parents with our roundtable. Kristen Candell is the recruitment specialist for the Sarasota YMCA Children Coalition. Catherine Shea is president and CEO of the Florida Center for Early Childhood. She also chairs the Community Alliance of Sarasota County. And Nathan Scott is a child welfare systems advocate with the Family Safety Alliance. And Catherine, you yourself were a foster parent who wound up adopting the child. Um, what was the circumstance, if, if you, you could tell us about, and how did it work out, and what kind of, you know, challenges did you face? Um, well, this was 1989, and I was, we were living in Albany, New York, and that's the time of the crack epidemic in New York City, and our little guy was born at Harlem Hospital, and um, they were actually putting out a call in a 150-mile radius for foster parents because the babies were sleeping in cribs in the DCF offices. Um, that's how bad it, it got. They ran out of foster homes, they ran out of kinship homes, and they had nowhere for the babies. So I worked for a nonprofit agency in Albany, and uh, we, we said we would take this on, and probably half of the employees said we'll do the foster parenting, um, but it's only temporary. <laughs> and um, so we got our little guy at four and a half months. He had been in the NICU the entire time diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome and some other substances, but primarily fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, and we fell in love with him. I mean, he was, you know, very delayed in development, uh, very flat affect from not really having stimulation and attention. But within a really short period of time, he was, you know, babbling and, um, you know, looking at us with smiles on his face. And so you just, you, you, I'm an infant mental health specialist, so, um, we fell in love, and it still took us four years to get him freed for adoption. Um, he's now 27. He's got developmental disabilities as a result of the fetal alcohol syndrome. But he is one amazing guy. He's very funny. He's so compassionate. He loves to dance and sing. And he wants to come here and assist in being a weatherman. I was supposed to tell you that. Bob. <laughs> Nathan. He's a really good weather guy. <laughs> um, Nathan, you, you have even more statistics showing just how acute uh, this problem is right here right now. I do. I actually um, just just recently got the, the final statistics for Narcan administration in Manatee County for July of 2016 and um, they administered over 700 doses of Narcan um, which is 157 percent approximately increase from last July and last July was the highest they'd ever seen of Narcan administration. You know, I know that local law enforcement got grants and got donations that allowed them to have the supply of Narcan. That's not going to last forever. And I know that the, the Sheriff Knight here in Sarasota County uh, has said that, you know, he will keep getting this uh, so that uh, deputies uh, have that supply on them uh, mm -hmm. when they right. respond to these situations. You know, Let's get down to it here. Money does not solve all problems, but it does solve some. And, uh, uh, you know, Kristen, what exactly do these social service agencies need in terms of funding and how specific, what would it go to? Certainly. It could go to um, quite a few things. So it could go directly to services for our children. Um, it could go to services for the parents who are trying to fight these addictions. Um, and we all know that this is something that um, is, not, is not cured very easily and not right away. Um, so it could go for things like that. Um, for, for our children specifically, I mean, we, we take care of things um, as simple as an after school activity, um, band lessons. Something like that. So um, there is a very, a very human perspective to this too. You know, but Catherine, I was f frankly blown away by something that you told the Bradenton Herald when they came out and, and talked to you a couple of weeks ago. We are in Florida the seventh friendliest state for personal and corporate taxes in the country, but we are 49th when it comes to funding social services like mental health. That's correct. 
you uh, ha are part of, of a coalition that is talking to our state legislators right now. Yes. And you made reference to it before, Senator Negron, who's the incoming mm -hmm. Senate uh, president, I mm -hmm. believe. Yes. What are you being told? Well, that's the message that we sort of heard today, and, and I think that's the political climate that we are living in in Florida, and that it is becoming more and more conservative. Uh, the other comment that Senator Negron said is that government should not be taking care of these people or paying for it, that charity should. Well, I, wa I run a nonprofit um, organization, and charities can't do this. We don't, you know, I don't know what the plan is that we're supposed to go get, you know, all these donors that want to give us money so we can do this. Um, but I believe that government does have a role in helping with these, the social problems that we have. Um, and if we don't get on a, a better path than what we